Signal. <clears throat> so, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody, <clears throat> and welcome to my presentation. This is in this um, session the third talk on reservoir computing, even though the title doesn't suggest it. <clears throat> For those who are familiar with reservoir computing, they will see it. Um, for those who are even more familiar with reservoir computing, um, they will see that there's a contradiction of terms here because echostate property is something that a reservoir computer has or doesn't have, and quantifying it is somewhat our um, homemade recipe that I'm going to talk about. Before I start, <clears throat> I'd like to acknowledge, of, of course, contributions by all my team members. Here, this is the main reference of the talk that I'm going to, <clears throat> um, the main reference for this talk and especially also Thomas Limburn has contributed most to this. But I'd also like to thank my former team and uh, collaborators in the EPISC, the Nonlinear Photonics Group in Palma de Mallorca. We had lots of interesting discussions about the topic of consistency with Ingo and all the other team members. And also they were doing reservoir computing at the time when I didn't do it and it was very inspiring and um, coined my course. Um, also this reference here is, uh, something relevant for this talk. Um, for those who <clears throat> have seen the previous two talks, um, yeah, just to see the language and the settings that I'm using for those who are new, of course, a crash course in reservoir computing. We have a dynamical system with something with around 100 or thousands of degrees of freedom, driven dynamical system. So you have an input signal, U of T driving all of this, um, yeah, certain design standard design principles how to set this up you can set it up in continuous time or the versions in discrete time depending on the context and what matters is you extract the linear combination so this is the part that is being trained when uh, the reservoir is used as a machine learning <coughs> um, technique <coughs> namely a linear combination is trained with respect to some um, target signal we call this here set of t we aim to use the minimize uh, the, the, the mean square error, some regularization. So we use rigid regression as a standard tool. And the main main point of <clears throat> of the talk today is going to be the echostate property, namely the case that this dynamical system here, the state of the system is a function of the drive u of t, which is also related to fading memory. Um, you can imagine this by the very the most simple toy system, a low-pass filter of that kind where you just have this simple equation and you can write it as a convolution with this exponential kernel function, which explicitly describes the fading memory. So you can think of the reservoir doing just the same as this, just with many degrees of freedom and nonlinearity. <clears throat> now about reservoir computing, it's something that uh, came up in computational neuroscience or in, in, in computer science almost simultaneously at the, the early 2000s but now is a growing area that's uh, increasingly coming in the focus of yeah, the dynamic co community that I'm speaking to. And it's a mutual benefit um, that, that's happening. Um, applications go in both directions. More often, I believe it's, it's happening that the reservoir computer is applied to analyze a dynamical system. And um, that was also the case in Thomas' talk before me. What I'm going to talk about is the other direction uh, applying dynamical systems theory and time series analysis to learn about the function of the reservoir computer. So we want to understand <clears throat> the function of uh, this device, the relationship between the dynamics and the function as a statistical modeling to, uh, tool. And we'd like ideally to predict the performance by properties uh, of this dynamical system. And today, as I said, focus on the acoustic property. <clears throat> The name echo state already says it, so the, um, ref refers to the state of the system being an echo, so to say, on the, of, the, of the drive. And if we go to dynamical systems, this brings us back to <clears throat> um, the roots uh, of generalized synchronization. So we look at this very simple drive response scheme, an autonomous dynamical system driving um, this uh, response system. And we characterize this using the condition of the upper exponent with this partial linearization. <clears throat> so when this is negative, we have contraction of the response system and this corresponds to a functional relationship. Whereas if this is positive, it's expansion and we have yeah, no relationship. That's 
GS, and it's typically been studied in the context of uh, simple coupled maps uh, in, in a very theoretical domain. <clears throat> um, to get away from calculating Lyapunov exponents, here's the Abba Banel test. So this is a replica test to check for the presence of generalized synchronization by attaching just an identical copy of that system. And assuming they're on the same attractor, we say if uh, one of them is a function of the system, the other one is also going to be the same function. And therefore we can see identical synchronization between the original and the replica if the conditional Lyapunov exponent is negative. Um, and that's also the major constraint where consistency comes in and goes beyond <clears throat> the original concept of generalized synchronization. Now consistency, um, I already introduced here a number between zero and one, um, is supposed to not just classify the presence or absence of a functional relationship, but to quantify how much of a relationship there is. So here in this row, you see the input out, some examples of input and output relationships of different um, dependent strength. And here's the corresponding replica with, where everything is uh, symmetric. And therefore you can also measure on this level, the strength of the dependence with a simple correlation coefficient. And that's, that, that's what this um, gamma squared is. So <clears throat> the idea of the replica test, and that's, that's the main tool is to unwrap this very complicated nonlinear functional relationship. And especially if you look at a case like this, where you have um, GS and the, so, so which we call complete consistency, the gamma squared equal one, um, which might with a, certain, with a certain sampling be indistinguishable of this uh, case where there's no relationship and that was subject of this paper. So we're going actually from um, this functional dependence to, to some more probabilistic interpretation that has been also nicely described here. So that's the first step beyond GS. The second step is also bringing it into a more applied and experimental domain um, <clears throat> where you, you don't want to just consider um, a drive dynamical system and response dynamical system, but you might want, want to first consider arbitrary driving signals. And you might also want to consider um, an arbitrary system that transforms the input signal to an output signal. So I'm, therefore I'm just in, uh, depicting this here as a black box. And instead of building a replica, we're just repeatedly driving the same system. And that was <clears throat> the idea that uh, Atsushi Yoshida, who is I think also watching now, introduced with Ralph Roy in 2004. You're repeatedly driving here this black box, which could, could also um, incorporate intrinsic noise or uh, measurement noise. <clears throat> you're driving this repeatedly and then you're measuring the coincidence, the um, agreement of, of these outputs, the quantifying this. Um, for this talk, there are some assumptions on ergodicity and stationarity and um, that you have long recordings. What's also important to note is that the consistency, the agreement that you measure between these outputs of the system is a function both of system parameters which is quite expected, but it's also, and that's something commonly underestimated, the function of the properties of the signal. That means you change the drive and you might have transitions between more or less consistent behavior. Here, just a little <coughs> um, experimental illustration. <coughs> um, th this, this here is measuring the consistency of a semiconductor laser and varying a parameter. You see transitions between different level of consistencies. <coughs> Um, very high consistency, very low consistency. So what causes this, if we relate this to the conditional Lyapunov exponent on, this, on the same scale, we see actually it's not something like positive Lyapunov exponent corresponding to this dropdown. It's uh, more like <clears throat> you have here in intermittency and uh, bubbling phenomena uh, related to <clears throat> the finite time fluctuations of the Lyapunov exponent. They are already in the experimental setup causes to break down. While, um, and also here, this is related to a signal to noise ratio, which you can also account for in consistency. In theory, this would go up to one. Um, in theory, we can consider <clears throat> an ensemble, infinite, uh, an infinite number of repetitions where you uh, have an infinite ensemble of outputs, equivalent outputs, just some conventional normalization. And we introduce the ensemble mean, which is sort of to say, what do all of these repetitions have in common? 
once we have this ensemble mean, we can write every individual realization as a sum of this ensemble mean plus the deviation from the ensemble mean. This has some interesting properties. In particular, we can then show that this consistency correlation, which is usually the um, cross correlation between a pair of replicas, is just a variant of this ensemble mean given this particular normalization convention. <clears throat> but more importantly, um, that brings us back to reservoir computing. If you have some arbitrary target signal, Z of T, um, any correlation between such an output of your black box and an arbitrary target signal is, we denote this here as alpha, is fundamentally limited by the level of consistency. And here we see also why we call this gamma squared because the limit is given by the square root of gamma squared, and it's alpha smaller than this gamma. <clears throat> so that's the fundamental limit. Now, coming back to apply these consistency ideas to a reservoir computer, we faced two challenges. First, you pr probably have noted that this black box previously produced just a scalar output and the reservoir is more than that. So we have first a multivariate response. And second, memory comes somehow in and is also related somehow to consistency. <clears throat> memory is usually um, res responsible or a main ingredient of the reservoir function. Here you see, for instance, if you have a chaotic uh, signal driving it, in the response of uh, the reservoir, you see all these nice um, shapes of embedding uh, corresponding to different attractor records. That's, that's why the um, reservoir works so well with chaotic systems. So let's look at this one after the other. First, <clears throat> that's also a main point of my talk today, um, the memory. <clears throat> In the context of consistency, we can actually go towards a new notion of fading memory. When I hear people in the community speak about fading memory. They think of this, so you have here this reservoir map and you can express X of T minus one again and then um, write the entire function just as a function of, uh, of the input and this goes on, on uh, <clears throat> until minus infinity. However, um, fading memory is set to take, uh, is set to take place when um, this converges so that we have a strict functional dependency just on these um, past states of the input. And this, of course, then corresponds to the echo state property or in our language here, complete consistency. Now, why is this an old, why, why do we need to revise this? Because if you think about it, um, you'll find <clears throat> that memory should be understood actually as, as all sort of impact of a past state on the present state. Yeah? And that, that means, <clears throat> for instance, if we, if we look here, this, this, these are here um, snapshots of exactly this functional relationship for an echo state network. So every column is a randomly picked uh, node of this echo state network. And every row corresponds to the particular time dependence. So this here is the instantaneous dependence where we, where we see the tangent hyperbolic shape. Um, the second step already, there's tangent, uh, so it's the second iterate of this function. It's a little bit more complicated than this keeps on complicating as we go down in the um, memory depth. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the red curve corresponds to the echo state network in its stable regime where it has the echo state property. So if, you, if we went down to, to minus infinity, we would just have to see a flat uh, dependence. But we also look in the chaotic regime. So we turn, so turn up some parameter in the chaotic regime. There's this scattered black points here there's still a signature of dependency. And that's, that's the main point. So to say this, this rest, um, this remainder of dependency, this is um, what we understand as this impact as the fading memory. <clears throat> so that means we can operate uh, an echo state network in a regime where there is no echo state. The second thing now we apply the replica task to the reservoir computer is the issue of um, yeah, the multivariate response. How, <clears throat> how do we address this? Just let's reconsider the setup. We repeat the drive at least twice to get an original replica. We say, we, we look at the uh, individual node responses and they might differ because of chaos, intrinsic noise or measurement noise. Now, naive approach would be to <clears throat> look at just the pairwise correlation of the individual nodes. 
case, then we get a set of n different consistency levels. But we could also think of the readout, um, which allows us to collect this entire thing into the previous uh, idea of the black box with a scalar output, and then define a readout consistency um, like this. And then it turns out that the individual node consistency is actually a special case of this because we can, in principle, arbitrarily um, yeah, select a readout that, or that selects the individual nodes and therefore um, this is actually the most general case, the readout consistency. Now let's have a look <clears throat> um, how this consistency behaves in, yeah, in the standard echo state network. We are varying the spectral radius, which is just a parameter that, that can induce transitions between stable and chaotic behavior. Here's a plot that shows over the spectral radius the average node consistency. Um, left of this transition point, we have the echo state property, complete consistency, so gamma squared is one. And then it goes gradually down in, into a more and more unreliable regime. Corresponding to this, we have here the memory integral, which is an integral over the <coughs> memory profile. How do we get this? <coughs> um, standard notion in, in reservoir computing the memory task, we set as a task to recall past states of the input and thereby probe the reservoir how much of this past input is still recoverable. And this gives us also, of course, for each tau different readout vectors and for each tau value a different level of consistency that we can measure at this readout. What we find is here as a function of tau, this um, memory profile, let's look at the red curve first. The, the solid curve is the memory profile and Remarkably, we, we worked in a regime where the average node consistency is 0.2. So this is on this scale, something like here. So quite a lot of noise due to chaos. Um, but still, at least for these short time lags, we get a very accurate reconstruction. The second thing that we see is the formula alpha smaller gamma that we had before. Namely, if we measure the consistency and plot the, the, the readout consistency, this is the dashed curve. It seems to be actually the limiting factor here or if we look at it in, the, in, in another way, um, the memory capacity explores as much as is possible by, given by the consistency. Um, the other one for comparison is creating a sa the same level of, um, mm. of inconsistency by adding noise on an otherwise stable reservoir. And it's actually it's the other way around. So the blue one is chaos and the red one is noise. And we see that the impact of adding noise is stronger despite having this have the, the same uh, inconsistency at the level of nodes. And this bring, this observation here, the high accuracy despite inconsistency and these, the difference between these curves brought us to think about um, how to go beyond the individual node level. And yeah, <clears throat> so, so to think about um, the issue of directionality because it's not just the individual um, <clears throat> coordinate axis, but the readout could actually select arbitrary linear combinations of the state of rest. So um, the state space offers much more than, than we see at the level of the individual nodes. And therefore we look now at the, um, at the entire portrait of the response. How do we do that? So this here <clears throat> depicts the, 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 the full response of the reservoir in state space. So this is for, for just, just an, uh, an illustration for two nodes, X1 and X2. Um, as measured by the covariance matrix of the reservoir. So this gives you this elliptic shape. Um, the inner ellipse describes the actual consistent part of the response. So how much of that is signal in response to the, um, to the input signal. In order to isolate that, I'm gonna skip through that uh, recipe relatively quickly. We apply a coordinate transformation, the sphering transformation, where the full response forms such an isotropic um, covariance. In, this co in these coordinates, we calculate the cross covariance matrix. And then the eigenvalues of this cross covariance matrix, these are our directional consistency levels. So they form a spectrum with n different characteristic levels of um, signal variance over the total variance. <clears throat> this we can also identify that here in the original coordinates. So this consistency spectrum, um, is the key to understanding actually 
the uh, impact of consistency to, <clears throat> on, on, on the reservoir performance. Um, yeah, just to have a look at different, different networks here, ring topology, sparse random, which is the standard and the fully, co fully connected graph. We sprinkle it with observational noise, we sprinkle it with intrinsic noise. The different colors correspond to um, different noise strength. Red is the low noise strength and blue is the highest noise strength. Um, what you see here is all those in a, in a reservoir with 200 degrees of freedom, all the 200 different eigen uh, values. And we see the main characteristics is despite noise, there are some directions which are very robust, very robust. And on the other end, there are some directions which are very sensitive. And this is also a mechanism that is exploited in the uh, regularization. And this looks quite the same throughout all these um, all these different network types. And um, that's, that's, also the, that's also the main insight, namely that these surviving very robust uh, directions in phase space, they are, they are carrying the signal through chaos and noise and also um, support this particular fading memory profile that we, um, that we observed in a highly chaotic regime. And with this, I'd like to wrap up. Yeah, consistency characterizes the response of a driven dynamical system complementary to conditional Lyapunov stability and beyond the binary classification of GS versus no GS. Um, the replica test or the replica setup of consistency unwraps an arbitrarily complicated functional dependency that allows us then to measure with a simple correlation measure between zero and one, the degree of functional dependency in theory, we think of all the responses as composed by a consistent response and an individual noise component. And consistency has the property to fundamentally limit all correlations of, of the output and they also reservoir performance. And um, yeah, a consistency spectrum reveals an interesting directionality um, effect relevant also for predicting performance. Some references and thanks a lot for watching. A fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Um, again, if there are any questions anyone wants to ask in the, the Q&A. Um, So I guess given, given no questions, um, I suppose one might be besides this kind of directionality and these sort of hints at deeper things, uh, where do you see this going? Where do you see the next kind of questions about asking about consistency and robustness and what other things we, we might learn from applying dynamical systems to reservoir computing? It's kind of a vague philosophical question. Mm. Um, ultimately, Anything that you can write down in terms of performance equals this and this and this, let's say a few parameters of the system, um, that's kind of the holy grail. And uh, I believe consistency, especially recently, we worked in, as you can find it in this um, conference proceeding of a conference which actually doesn't exist as a digital. <laughs> um, we figured out that if you sum up over all these gammas, you get a capacity measure. And that has quite some um, predictive capacity of uh, how it, for an arbitrary task your performance is going to be and similar to an old capacity, capacity measure that um, existed since 2012. Okay, and one other question uh, in the Q&A is what properties can you identify in reservoir computing by using multivariate consistency measures? How can it be applicable? Um, in the end, <clears throat> I would say if you, if you look at these, um, for instance, some tiny detail that I, that I didn't further focus on is like you see here in this ring topology um, that all these curves are slightly higher than, uh, than, than in the other topologies. So this is something that you might want to have. So um, if, if you study this, you, you, you see um, how many degrees of freedom survive actually um, noise or chaos or even regularization has uh, plays a different role like obvious, uh, observational noise. And that may help you uh, um, as an indicator um, on how, how to design the reservoir. Um, 
Okay, I, th I think that, that more or less brings us to the end of time. So I want to thank you again very much for your talk, Thomas, and then thank all of the speakers. Uh, the session was quite good.